All right, let's take our Bibles again, shall we? And let's turn to John 12, if you will. John chapter 12. Yeah, if you were with us last uh, week, you know, chapter 11 is a wonderful chapter, right? It's, it's the raising of Lazarus. But that got Jesus into hot water. Because of Lazarus being raised, the Jewish leaders determined, okay, this can't go on any longer. And so they plotted Jesus' death. When we come to chapter 12, notice the first verse. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. And there... They made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table. And then that set up this opportunity for Mary to take a, 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 a pound of perfume of ointment of spikenard, very expensive, costly, anointing the feet of Jesus, wiping then his feet with her hair and the house then being filled with that fragrance. It's almost Passover, according to verse 1. Passover would be the time that God himself would appoint for Jesus to die. You see, over and over again in the Gospel of John, you'll find the, the timing. It's just not his hour yet but it now has come to that hour that Jesus will be offered up in death as a sacrifice on the behalf of his father. What we have here in chapter 12 is the finishing of Jesus's public ministry. Jesus had a public ministry from his 30th year to his 33rd year of life. About three, three and a half years, he had public ministry. Here it finishes up. In fact, if you'll note in verse 36, the, the, uh, the last sentence says, These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. So he's finishing his public ministry, and there is a crisis that has been building that is going to result when we get to chapter 19 in his crucifixion, in his death. But just before that, so from chapter 12 uh, to the end of the book, it's, it's really all about Passover. It's just a week in time. We have to understand that. But what I want you to see as we begin in the 12th chapter is the anointing of Jesus. And the purpose of that is very important. And what all that means to us, I think, is also vital. But let's pause a moment. Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, once again, we look to you, and we thank you so much that you have given us this word. We thank you for this act of Mary in anointing Jesus and all that that entails. Give us some understanding that will really minister to our hearts as individuals personally. Lord, I thank you for these young ladies uh, whose heart you worked in. And I pray for our teens that you would continue that good work that you've begun in each one of them. We thank you that we can be confident that you won't quit, that you will perform it until the day of Christ. Now use this passage in our hearts for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. He's in Bethany. That's just a couple of miles from Jerusalem. It's one of his favorite places, and it is, as we've noticed, at the beginning of the last week of Jesus's life on earth. And as we've read in the first three verses, he's the guest of honor uh, in a, at a dinner. We have other parallel gospels that give us more information than John 12. We're told in another gospel that... Uh, it was held in the home of Simon, who previously was healed by Jesus 
from leprosy. And here he is in Simon's house. He's with his 12 disciples. Lazarus, obviously, is there. Martha is serving. And Mary is there as well. There are three key people that I want to point out, however, at this dinner. And the first one is Mary herself. She has some insight that others don't have. Mary realizes that Jesus is about to be crucified. The others, even though Jesus has spoken about this on numerous occasions, are rather oblivious to it. And there's a reason for that. Every time you see Mary in the scriptures, she is always at the feet of Jesus. And I'm telling you, folks, symbolically, whenever we're at the feet of Jesus, whenever we are at his feet worshiping him, he then can share his heart with us, and we can have insight, and we can have wisdom from him that other believers never are able to tune into. And so she realizes that Jesus is about to die, and uh, she wants to show her devoted love to him before it's too late. And the Bible says when Jesus defends her, he says that she has done this, in verse 7, against the day of my burying. You see, the Jewish people, when a person died, they would, uh, they would anoint the bodies of these dead people with spices that would perhaps help because they didn't embalm bodies in that uh, arid climate, and you can imagine how quickly decomposition would take place. But also some people believe that the spices that they would anoint bodies with would uh, hasten the actual decay of the decomposition of the flesh because at a year's time, they would then take the bones and put them in a special box called an ossuary, as, uh, and uh, they would then have space for another relative in that uh, carved out stone uh, tomb. But anyway, she did this because she realized this was going to be her only opportunity. She was showing her loving devotion for the Lord when she had an opportunity to. Do you remember there were other ladies after his death when he was put into the tomb that came with spices to anoint the body, but did they have an opportunity to do that? No. It was too late. When they came to anoint the body of Jesus, he wasn't there. He had already risen from the dead. And the point is simply this. If you are in tune with the heart of Jesus, you won't miss opportunities to show your loving devotion to him you won't wait too long. You won't put it off and procrastinate. You'll do it while you have the opportunity available. Some people, some believers think, well, you know what? When I'm a little older, especially young people, when I'm a little older, I'm going to follow Jesus more closely. You may not ever have that opportunity to do it. Do it now while the opportunity exists. Even those of you that are older, you've been saying things that you want to do for the Lord. And it's never gotten done. You're procrastinating. Now you're, you're up in age and you're getting older and older. And you still haven't accomplished what you said you want to do for him. And you're going to miss the opportunity. You're going to wait too long and it's going to be too late. Not Mary. She was revealing her devotion and her love to the Lord before it was too late. It's really a great illustration, the anointing that she undertakes of her Savior. She is taking something that is very costly, very expensive. In fact, uh, Judah says, you could have sold that three, for 300 pence. Well, 300 pence is the equivalent of a common laborer's annual wages. That's a year's salary for a common laborer. That's how expensive this perfume was that uh, she anointed his feet with I think Mark says she also anointed his head with it. 
And so she takes something that's very personally, personally costly to her. And in loving sacrifice, she lavishes it. She, she breaks open the top of this beautiful alabaster uh, jar where this perfume was being held. And she poured out almost a pint of it upon his head and on his feet. And as a result, there are ripples that come from that. But one of the greatest is that there have been ripples of blessing that have been emanating from her act of devoted love to the Lord ever since she did it. Obviously, there was blessing to everyone in that house. The whole house, it says, was filled with the fragrance of this aromatic perfume. Not only that, Jesus says in another gospel account that wherever the gospel is preached, the deed that Mary did here in this act of sacrificial love and devotion to the Lord will be preached. And so the ripple of her, of her act of devotion not only had an immediate effect, but continues to even to us here today and will, just as Jesus said. And so this is, a, is an amazing thing that this woman does. does. It's an expression of her love to the Lord and her thanks to the Lord for, I'm, I'm sure, restoring her brother back to life and uh, for just who he was in her life. Now let's think about ourselves for a moment and how we might compare or contrast ourselves to Mary. I heard of a pastor that was speaking at a missions conference and he was challenging the people there in the audience to, to give God a valuable token of their deep love to the Lord, like Mary did here. Something that was of great value to them. Something that it would really cost them to give to God. Later, months after that, the speaker got a letter from a widow. And as he read the letter, he realized that this widow was telling him that as a result of his challenge at that missions conference, she had been holding back her daughter from becoming a missionary. But she gave her daughter to the Lord. She broke that alabaster uh, jar of ointment, so to speak. And uh, she gave that precious daughter to the Lord so that she could serve him anywhere in the world that he chose to send her. And I wonder, based on the act of Mary here, I wonder, is there someone or is there something something precious in your sight, someone precious in your sight that you should give to the Lord, that perhaps you haven't surrendered to the Lord. Perhaps you've been holding back that thing or that person from the Lord that he wants you to give to him as a act of devoted sacrificial love to him, your affection for the Lord. Well, that's the first person, but then there is another person that comes to light here, and his name is Judas in verse 4. He's the one that uh, protested what just happened. Basically, he when he says, why wasn't this sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Jesus says, in, or, or rather, John tells us in verse 6, he didn't say that because he really cared about the poor. He cared about the money because he was a thief and he was the treasurer of the group of disciples and he had been pilfering and he had been taking money without anyone knowing it from the disciples' treasury. He had been taking money for himself, stealing it without them knowing it. He didn't care about the poor. But the fact of the matter is, Judas is such a contrast to Mary, right? Mary, she is willing to take in real love, sacrifice and lavish upon the Lord the best that she had. And Judas looks upon what Mary did and he basically says this, you wasted, you wasted that perfume on Jesus. 
often when believers surrender that which is valuable to them, whether it be a loved one or whether it be something else, something that they or themselves that they give to the Lord to do with whatever he chooses, sometimes that is slandered. That kind of love for the Lord is slandered. And uh, people think, oh, what a waste. He's, he or she, they're throwing their life away. They're wasting their life following the Lord on a, on a foreign mission field or whatever it might be. Why, he could have he made uh, six or seven figures in the business world if he would not have followed the Lord and gone into ministry or her, whoever. What a waste. That's how the world sees it. And sadly to say, that's how some believers see it because they haven't been at Jesus' feet like Mary. And so Judas is really a hypocrite. He's, he's a hypocrite pretending to care for poor people when actually in his heart, he is a thief that has habitually stole the money of Jesus and the disciples. And he is money hungry. He's greedy. And really, when you think about it, that greed in his heart led him to betray Jesus. Remember, he betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And uh, he's one that, that he wants certain things for himself. And when he doesn't get it, then he gets angry and he betrays the Lord Jesus. The third person uh, to really focus on in this passage is, of course, Jesus himself. And notice what Jesus responds to Judas's condemnation. In verse 7, Judas, uh, G G Jesus speaks up and says to Judas, leave her alone. He says, let her alone. Let me tell you why she did this. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor, always you have with you, but me, you have not always. Jesus protects Mary. Isn't that wonderful? He protects her. He approves of what Judas thought was a waste of money. And then he interprets for not only uh, the disciples and people that were there at that dinner, but for us as well. He interprets for us what that act of devotion really was about. And he rewards her love because it will never be forgotten. It's mentioned every time this passage is looked at. It's a wonderful thing how the Lord cared for Mary. And you can trust him. When you step out to surrender you, yourself, and everything that you have to the Lord, no matter what others might think or no matter what other people might do, you can trust God. He's going to protect you. He approves of that kind of full surrender. And uh, in the end, he will vindicate you. You can trust him. Then there's another movement in this chapter. After the anointing, then there's an arriving. And what it is, is Jesus arriving in Jerusalem for the very last time. What is called in the Gospels the triumphal entry? It picks up in verse uh, number 12. And it is the next day after he... Uh, after that dinner, it says in verse 12, on the next day, much people that were come to the feast, that is the Passover feast in Jerusalem, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and they went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, he's riding in to Jerusalem for the last time in his earthly ministry on a young donkey. And uh, it's in fulfillment, verse 15 says, of Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, which predicts that the Messiah would come into Jerusalem just like that, in humility, riding on a donkey's foal, and also peacefully, not coming with a, a warrior's uh, bow, but rather coming humbly, and peacefully. Jesus is a very controversial figure. There's no way that he is going to enter into the religious center of Judaism, the city of Jerusalem, unnoticed. He is. It would be impossible for him to come there secretly. So his coming is announced 
The people are waving palm branches, which really are like patriotic symbols of victory. And they're shouting Hosanna, which means save now. It's actually a quote from the 118th Psalm, verse 25. He's fulfilling prophecy. He is presenting himself just as the prophet said he would, as Israel's Messiah. And the crowd made the leaders of the Jewish people very worried. In fact, look at their response in verse 19. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see, you observe, perceive, how nothing we've done has, has worked. How ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world has gone after him. I mean, that obviously is a little bit of hyperbole, of exaggeration. However, you have to understand that Jerusalem, during the Passover feast, one of the main, one of the main pilgrim feasts, when Jews and uh, Gentiles that were God-fearing people would come from all over the world to worship in Jerusalem at the temple. And so there were crowds there. And I think it's interesting that they say the world has gone after him. In other words, not just Jewish people, but the nations as well. And I think what he's referring to fits very clearly into the next section. Because when you pick up in verse 20, here's what we read. And there were certain Greeks, which were Gentiles. There were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. Evidently, these Greeks were what were technically called God-fearers. They were Gentiles that had attached themselves to Judaism because they had an interest in the God of Israel, and yet they had not become full-fledged pros proselytes where they had converted to Judaism, but they were on that road to do so. And so these Greeks, they must have been encouraged by what they heard and what they saw. Look, the Pharisees are saying, the whole world has gone after him. Maybe they heard that, and uh, maybe they got that same idea, and that encouraged them as God-fearers to ask for a private interview with Jesus. That's what they're asking here. Look at this, verse 21. These Greeks, they came to Philip. Why Philip? Well, Philip is the only disciple that has uh, a Greek name. Philip is a Greek name. It's not a Jewish name. And so they come to Philip, and uh, they say they desired of him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Don't you love that phrase? Sir, we would see Jesus. Now, they're asking for a private interview with Jesus. Whether that, that was ever granted to them, we're not told in this passage. But what I want you to understand is that these Greeks were not seeking, like the Jewish people, miracles. They weren't asking for miracles from Jesus. They were not seeking the works of Jesus. They were seeking Jesus himself, personally. They were seeking him. They wanted to see him. Sirs, we would see Jesus. We are seeking him. I hope that if you haven't, that you would make that your watchword every day. Lord, I want to see Jesus. I want to see Jesus when I open my Bible. I want to see Jesus in the lives of my brothers and sisters. I want Jesus to be seen in me through my life. I want Jesus to be seen in the way that I act, in the things that I say. Sir, we would see Jesus, they said to Philip. What this tells me about these people is that when Jesus arrived, there were people seeking him. You know what? That's really the best position for any human being to ever be in to be a seeker after Jesus. If you're not, let me just call you to that. 
Make that your main task in life. Make that the thing that you seek more than anything else. I would say to young people, I would say to older people, to anyone, seek Jesus. Have the same slogan that Paul had in Philippians chapter 3. He said, my one ambition in life is that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Here was a man that had known and served the Lord Jesus for some 30 years, and yet he's still seeking Jesus. And I want to challenge us, like these Greeks, to say in our heart, if not audibly, I want to see Jesus. Take me to Jesus. Seek Jesus like these people did. And then notice how Jesus eventually responds. If you follow along, Philip comes to Andrew, and Andrew then and Philip together come to Jesus, and they tell him, these Greeks, they want to talk to you. Jesus answered, verse 23, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now, what hour do you think that might be? It certainly is the hour of his death and all that ensued and followed after. And then he says this, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, except a corn or a grain of wheat fall into the ground, a seed fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. But he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause, I came unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. There you see a mixture, right, of his humanity. And yet the heart of our Lord is, I want to glorify the Father. Jesus is about to be glorified, and in that he will glorify his Father as well. But I want you to think about that grain of wheat that he talks about in verse 24. A seed, just a seed. You know, seeds, they're small. Some are bigger than others, but... Generally speaking, seeds are very small things. But what we realize about seeds, even though they're, they're small and dried up, in a seed resides life. There is God-given life in a seed. Of itself, the seed is just weak and, and useless. But when that seed is planted, it dies. And as a result of that, life sprouts up from it, and it becomes fruitful. It fulfills the purpose for which that seed exists. But that purpose is not fulfilled until that seed is planted. It's nothing. It's a useless thing. But when it's planted, it fulfills the purpose for which it exists. Well, what he's saying here is about himself, but also it's about believers. Believers are like seeds. No matter what we might have after our names, no matter how big the human accolades might be attributed to any believer, we're like seeds. We're all small and we're all insignificant. But the truth about believers is that God's life resides in us. We're like seeds because we're small and insignificant, but we have a life of God within us. But that life of God in the believer will never be fulfilled until the believer is planted. And by that, it, it, we mean until the believer yields that life to God. Until the believer surrenders the life to God. Until the believer is crucified, lives that crucified life that I spoke about in the Selah time. The crucified life is that you surrender yourself and all that you are. 
And in doing so, you also depend upon the Lord and his life in you to accomplish his purpose through you. Here's the question. Are you living a comfortable life? Or are you living a conformable life? That's what he's talking about here in the 25th and 26th verse. If you love your life, you'll lose it. If you are making sure that your life here is a comfortable one, a convenient one, that you come and go as you please, that you live as you please, you will lose your life. Rather, our lives are not meant to be comfortable. They're meant to be conformable. And by that, I mean this. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate that they would be conformed to the image of his dear son. That he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's what I mean by conformable. So are you living a comfortable Christian life? Or are you living a life in which you are allowing through surrender and dependence upon God, your life to conform more and more to take on the image of Jesus? Is your life Christ-like in that way? That's what this is all about. That's what he's talking about. If you are protecting your plans for your life, your desires for your life, if you're saving your life, if, if you never allow your life to be planted, so to speak, to be surrendered, you're going to waste it. You're going to lose your life. Let me, let me implore you. Let me plead with you. Let me appeal to you today. Don't waste your life. Don't waste your life by just pursuing what you want to do, by following your plans for your life, by doing what you feel like doing. That's a waste, and you'll lose your life. But if you surrender your life to the Lord, if you let God plant you, you're going to enjoy a fruitful and a purposeful life. It, remember Judas, he said, the pouring out of that ointment is a waste. Well, the pouring out of your life and surrender to the Lord is not a waste. It brings forth much fruit. That's what he says here. And you'll lead, you'll lead a purposeful life that will please God. And then he talks about uh, his suffering. When he says, the hour is come where the Son of Man shall be glorified. Father, glorify thy name. When he talks about this, this seed of wheat falling into the ground and dying, he's talking about his own death and what comes of it through his resurrection. But here's the fact. He's talking about suffering. And he's basically telling us this. There's no glory without suffering in the will of God. Now, not all suffering leads to glory. But if you're suffering according to the will of God, that always ends up glorious. It always leads to glory. And, he, and it will lead to victory. If you suffer in the will of God, you will live a victorious Christian life. It will lead to the glory of God. And God will glorify you as he conforms you more and more to the image of his son. In fact, he says in this, uh, in this same passage that Satan himself and this world is defeated by Jesus who offers himself up as this seed that falls into the ground and dies. He talks about uh, Satan being judged, the prince of this world being judged, and this world itself being judged. And it's based upon the fact that he has not spared himself, but he has offered up himself to the Lord. I can't put my, my uh, uh, fingers on that exact passage, but it's in this 12th, the, the exact verse, but it's in this 12th chapter. And then he says something wonderful that I think often is, is misunderstood. Oh, here it is. 
In verse 31, he says, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. He's talking about the victory that will come through his crucifixion and resurrection. Through his death, he will defeat Satan. Paul says that in Colossians chapter 2. That through his death, he spoiled principalities and powers. He defeated them. He stripped them of their armament. He stripped them of their authority and power. He did that through his death at the cross. And in his resurrection, he then ascends and he is seated on the throne far above all of these sat satanic entities. And the world itself is judged by Jesus' being that seed that falls into the ground and dies and brings forth a life of victory and glory. Look at the victory in verse 32. Jesus said, and I... If I be lifted up from the earth, and he's talking about on the cross, on that piece of wood, on that tree, and if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. That doesn't mean that all people are going to be saved, but that means that he will draw Jew and Gentile, all people without distinction, without uh, uh, nationality, or, or call it race. I think there's only one race, human race. But the fact of the matter is, He's going to draw all people to himself. There's going to be in heaven people from every nation, every language group, every tribe on the face of the earth that ever has existed. And I, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all of these to myself. What a victory. This seed falling into the ground is going to bring, and what glory. And then verses really 37 to 50 are just a summarizing where uh, John, the gospel writer, he's just assessing everything. And the key word in this final section is the word believe. In verses 37 to 50, eight times you'll find the word believe. And, you, and I want to point out, beginning in verse 37 and down through verse 40, three different stages of belief or unbelief, I should say, people that didn't believe. In verse 37, he says, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. There's the first group of, of people of unbelief. They would not. They would not believe in Jesus, despite the evidence that was so clearly presented to them they would not believe. Some reject Jesus because they fear what other people will think or do. And uh, so they want man's approval more than they want God's approval. So there is, first of all, those in unbelief, they would not believe. But look with me in verse uh, 38 and 39. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Notice this. Therefore, they could not believe because Isaiah said, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. So there are those that would not believe and then in verse 39, there are those that could not believe, which then would include in verse 40, those that should not believe. This is interesting, and this is very sobering to think about. The truth that is being communicated here is simply this. Be careful about unbelief, because what he's saying here Light can be resisted, and when light is constantly resisted, something happens, something changes inside of a person, something happens inside, something begins to change within, and it comes to a place where a person can't believe. The danger of resisting the truth that God gives to us so clearly, so evidently, 
That's what happened to the nation of Israel. It's called judicial blindness. That is, they are blind as a nation to the truth of Jesus because they would not. And so God says in Isaiah the prophet, chapter 6, because you would not, you cannot. You can't believe. Now, thankfully, we are told in Romans 11 that the blindness of Israel is only temporary. It's temporary. God's going to remove it someday, and there is going to be a remnant nation of Israel that will be saved. But I'm telling you, this is dangerous stuff. I think that's why the prophet says in Isaiah 55 and verse 6, he says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Don't put it off, in other words. Don't procrastinate. Don't wait. Don't resist any longer. Seek God while you have the opportunity, while you're here, while you, while you can understand, while, while the opportunity, don't miss the opportunity. Don't let the window or the door slam shut on you. There are those that secretly believe, but don't openly confess the Lord because it would be too costly to them. Look at verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also, many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. That is one of the biggest dangers in life, is to want people's approval over God's approval. Which is it with you? You want God's approval most or someone else's approval? These people were tight-lipped about their heart faith in Jesus because they feared people, and they wanted people to approve of them. Perhaps they'd lose their job. Perhaps they might be kicked out of the house or shunned as a family member. Who knows? But it was too cost. Listen, there's nothing too costly for us to give to have a personal, vibrant relationship with the Lord. It's like our lives are like in an alabaster box, and, and we are to break it and pour all the contents of our life out and lavish it upon the Lord in real devotion. Well, chapter 12, I've titled it Christ in Crisis. But actually, you know what? When you read it and understand, it's actually people that are in crisis, not Jesus. It's people that are in crisis because of the response to Jesus. In fact, in verse 34, notice their question. Who? The Son of Man? He's going to be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? You got that figured out? Who is this Son of Man? Are you confused about that still? Are you convinced that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world? If so, have you resisted that or have you received him? Because now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. And if you have received him, have you ever anointed him? That is, have you broken the alabaster box of your life and poured out the entire contents of your life in loving, lavish devotion to your Lord? Have you anointed him with perhaps something or someone that is precious to you that you have been reserving for yourself and have not given to him? These Greeks, they were seeking the Lord. Are you seeking him? Have you sought him today? Have you sought the Lord yet today? Seek him every day? Do you seek him alone? Sirs, we would see Jesus. We're not asking to see anyone else or anything else. We would see Jesus. We're not looking to see his miracles. We want to see him. Is that what you seek? Is that what you want to see? 
Are you willing to suffer as that seed that God places and that God puts into the ground, so to speak? Are you willing to be placed wherever God would put you and let him then manifest his life through your life and bring forth real fruitfulness and real purpose? Those are the questions that come out of John chapter 12 as I see it. Let's pray.